Hello class, this is your week six, your first lecture on disease prevention. To say that technology is not my strength and that I learned a lot in my first weeks in learning to record lectures, I thought I had worked all of the, the wrinkles out and clearly I had not. Um, so if those of you all who have tried to watch your lecture this week, you've probably noticed by now that you don't have any volume. So I am re-recording this and we'll get it posted as soon as possible. And that being said, there is a little bit of a change in the schedule. So for week six, it was supposed to be disease prevention and vaccinations. And then week seven was disease prevention and deworming. However, I had planned to do guest lectures and life gets busy and we, d we will have the guest lectures, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to record this lecture on disease prevention and then your second lecture this for this week will be on colic and lameness just because anybody that's worked for the horse industry for very long knows that lameness and colic are very large issues and infect the industry all across the board. So good topics to be familiar with. And then for week seven, we will do um, vaccinations and deworming together. And the vaccinations and deworming for week seven, if you're tired of listening to my lectures, um, they will be guest lectures from Holly Cruz. She's a third year vet student, a really good friend of mine that I worked on my master's with while in Texas. And so she took time out of her schedule to record us some guest lectures, um, information that she is very knowledgeable about. So that's gonna be the minor change in the schedule. I know initially when I had recorded this lecture, it was 58 minutes. I still have all of um, the same notes and information prepared, but I'll probably move through it a little more quickly since we are re-recording. For those of you that are also in basic equitation, these first couple of slides are going to be repetitive. Um, make sure that Either one, you can watch them again. I think it's great to get information twice. You'll probably notice something that you didn't notice the first time. It's a good review. It's a good studying tool. However, if you do choose to skip over these slides that are um, somewhat repetitive and covering the same information that has already been covered in Basic Ec, make sure that you watch the last three slides. The last three slides are not the same as for what is covered in Basic Equitation. I'm going to talk about a couple of diseases of the lower limb and the hooves that affect horses. So we're going to talk about navicular disease or navicular syndrome, white line disease, and then also laminitis, sometimes referred to as founder. So make sure if you're confident in this information and you don't need to review it, make sure that you get the new content at the end of the lecture. Um, in discussing disease prevention, it's very important that we provide our horse with the basic care and necessities. A lot of times we overlook the basics when it comes to horse care. We overlook the basics when it comes to riding. And when we overlook the basics, it's very hard to build upon those building blocks. So many times when we're having issues with our horses, whether that be um, training or in a disease that is continuously popping up a lot of times if we look back at our basics and we better set that up then we're going to benefit ourselves in the long run. So our first steps of basic disease prevention is making sure that we provide those necessities our horses need. They need water, they need free choice or ad lib access to water. Our horses are going to drink approximately five gallons of water a day give or take so during the winter months they may drink a little less and during the summer months drink more. Our horses that are more active, that are training more frequently, again, those horses are going to have a higher water intake. So it's ideal to provide a clean, fresh water source ad lib. Additionally, we want to consider feed. Um, good quality forage and grain is essential. This week through work, we've been having the Alltech One Conference, um, the equine session, and so in watching those, um, I've listened to a couple of individuals. I know the head trainer at Windstar Farm. Um, he was discussing how training technique is important in developing winners and having horses that do perform and win on the track. 
But that what a lot of people overlook is a good quality forage and a good quality grain. So it's imperative that we are providing our horses home with their nutritional needs in that aspect. Keep in mind that we talked about in our nutrition section last week, I believe it was, um, we covered nutrition and we talked about how it was essential to provide a good quality forage, whether that be a legume or a grass hay, and that estimated um, feeding at 2% of body weight is a good baseline. For your harder keepers, it might be 2.5%. For your easy keepers, it may drop down to 1% or 1.5%. And then our grain, we're providing as a supplementation. So we're providing grain for horses that need a higher calorie intake. Um, or we may just be providing a ration balancer to ensure that our horse is receiving the additional um, vitamins and minerals that may not be provided in their forage, whether that be grass or hay. And another thing we want to consider when looking at the necessities for horses is shelter. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what the IACUC standard is um, here in Kentucky for universities, but I know when I was in school at Texas when we considered shelter, it was a requirement that all of our horses on the farm have access to shelter for a minimum of 12 hours a day. Shelter could be considered a lean-to like's photograph. We have a number of those at Western's Farm. It could be providing shelter in a barn and a stall. Um, trees are also considered shelter. So ensuring that our horse has um, adequate access to shelter to get out of the elements, whether it be wind, um, rain, snow, sleet, or even direct sunlight. It's important that not only it's very important that we are keeping these shelters clean. Um, so most of you are familiar with horses that are in um, wet or moist environments frequently with their hooves that they can encounter um, thrush and a number of other issues um, with their feet and their hooves. So it's important that we're not only providing this shelter to um, keep them out of the elements, but that we are keeping it um, clean because maintaining um, moisture within these lean-tos or not cleaning stalls um, as frequently as we should, um, we're going to run the risk of thrush and having soft and brittle hooves. And we're also, um, when moisture is present, we may create a, um, a ground that different types of um, external parasites are going to be um, breeding in that area. So we want to make sure that we're not only providing shelter, but that we are keeping it clean. The next thing that we want to consider in preventative care is parasite control. Parasite control is going to be inclusive of external and internal parasites. So a couple of examples of external parasites would be house flies, stable flies, horse and deer flies, mosquitoes, bot flies, and then lice. So making sure that we're keeping our horses um, sprayed down with fly sprayer, we have other adequate control in place at our barn and our facilities. And then we also want to consider internal parasites. So internal parasites are going to be our ascarids or roundworms, our strongyles, which are also referred to as bloodworms, um, pinworms, and then tapeworms, just to mention a few. So making sure that we have a um, deworming program in place that is effective, making sure that we are um, worming for, or deworming for the the correct internal parasites um, seasonally. The next thing that we want to consider is vaccinations. There's a large number of vaccinations that horses can receive. Um, a good rule of thumb and what I typically do is I do vaccinations annually. Um, for my aged horses I do them annually and then I normally do a five-way. So a five-way is going to include um, equine encephalitis, equine influenza, eastern and western, rhino pneumonitis, and tetanus. So that five-way is a good booster um, to give annually to our horses. 
There's a couple of other vaccinations that will be recommended depending on the area you live in, the frequency at which you travel, and we will cover those vaccinations in depth when we get to um, that presentation next week. A couple of other vaccinations to be familiar with is the rabies vaccine and also strangles. Strangles is a unique in how we give that vaccination. Um, and there's also a little bit of controversy behind it. So strangles um, vaccine is actually given intranasally. So instead of um, an injection intermuscularly, um, as we do IM injections for majority of vaccines in horses, strangles is actually giving, given intranasal. Um, and a negative Coggins test is what is required to show that our horse is um, negative for strangles. So I've included just a, a little cutout of our Coggins test for our horses on the right hand side there. Preventative care is also inclusive of dental care. So we wanna make sure that we are calling out an equine dentist, that we're having routine examinations and floating. Typically dental care is recommended um, annually. However, for horses that are um, younger, for horses that are considered senior or age, and also those horses that have special cases, then it is recommended to do a six months um, routine checkup and floating. Hoof care is also very important, so making sure that our horses are seeing a farrier on a routine schedule. Um, our farriers typically will provide service every six to eight weeks, whether that be a trim or shoeing. Horses are individuals and their needs are going to vary from horse to horse. However, I like to think of um, the use of hoof care and utilizing our farriers as being somewhat of an insurance tool on ensuring that our horses are, we're setting them up for success by having a good trim, by setting up the angles correctly, um, by setting that horse as they should be set. Oftentimes we are going to prevent lameness issues. We are going to prevent issues as this horse ages and as they are used later on down the road. So that farrier one is one that sometimes will, you know, will will extend out and will wait longer than we should. And ultimately this is going to be a very important preventative care for maintaining a horse long term. When considering the normal vital signs for a horse um, those are going to be as listed below. So for temperature, our horse is going to be 99 to 101 degrees Fahrenheit. For their pulse or heart rate, it's going to be 28 to 44 beats per minute. And for respiration, it's going to be 10 to 24 breaths per minute. So there is some level of variation. Um, when a horse is exercising or exerting themselves, um, they will increase to the upper limits potentially. Um, however, anything outside of this limits is going to be a strong indicator of injury or issue that needs to be addressed. As we've discussed time and time again, there's variation from horse to horse. And that being said, it is ideal for you um, as a horse owner or someone that is riding or caring for a horse to know what is normal for that individual. So assess the temperature, the pulse, and the respiration of that animal and record that periodically so that if your horse does tend to have a temperature of 99, um, a spike to 101 may not be normal for them. And so keeping those recorded and on hand so that if there is an injury and when your vet arrives that you know what's normal and you can better assess the situation. When taking a horse's temperature, you will want to stand to the side and the back of the horse. The tail will need to either be tied up or held by the handler. Um, you should place a small dab of Vaseline or some kind of lubrication on the end of the thermometer and raise the tail with one hand and insert the thermometer into the rectum with the other. Once in place, you will then turn on the thermometer and wait for the temperature reading. It's not a bad idea to have a string attached to your 
thermometer so that you can ensure that you won't lose it. If you lose your thermometer, you're going to have bigger issues than just taking your horse's temperature. Um, so horse's temperatures are going to be taken rectally and a normal temperature for a horse is going to be 99 to 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is going to transfer to approximately 38 degrees Celsius. As for the horse, horse's pulse, there are many areas where the pulse can be found with ease. One of the most accessible is right behind the jawbone, so this is shown in the lower left hand photo. By placing your fingers on the left side of the jaw just above where the cheekbone um, curves, there is an artery here that will feel like a raised cord. By applying pressure, um, you will then count for a minute and this will determine the beats per minute or the horse's pulse. The lower right hand photograph um, is another area of which you can feel the horse's pulse and it can be felt just above the sesamoid bones on the legs. When the pulse is taken here, it is considered a digital pulse. So neither way is more right than the other. Um, some people have a tendency to be able to feel a pulse in a different area easier. Um, so make sure that when you're feeling for your horse's pulse, you can fill in one of these areas and that you are counting for one minute. A normal pulse, as we stated before, is going to be 28 to 44 beats per minute. As for respiration, um, respiration can be assessed by watching the rise and fall of the rib cage. One breath is one intake and one exhale. So inhale and exhale counts as one. The inhalation and exhalations need to be equal in length and there should be no exaggeration. Another way that you can determine the respiration of a horse, you can watch their flaring of their nostrils, um, their inhaling and exhaling. You can place your hand a couple of, of inches from the nostril and the muzzle and you can feel the horse breathing. Um, horses that, that aren't as socialized or haven't had this been done before, uh, it may affect the respiration rate because they may be sniffing um, your hand as, as where a result of where it's located. So, but a couple of different options, um, each one you can use in determining the respiration rate of a horse. As a normal respiration rate is 10 to 24 breaths per minute. Next we have the hydration test. A healthy horse should drink approximately five gallons of water a day, as we've discussed and hit on a couple of times, and it is important to monitor how much your horse drinks to prevent dehydration from occurring. In order to test your horse, you will pinch a small amount of skin and then let it go. The skin should immediately return back in place. However, if the horse is dehydrated, the skin will remain wrinkled. So you can see in the photograph below that this individual is um, pinching a piece of skin on the horse's neck. When she releases, it should immediately return back into place. It shouldn't remain um, folded or wrinkled for any period of time. And that's how we're going to do the hydration test. For the capillary refill test, this test allows you to assess the horse's circulation. To test this, lift the horse's lip and firmly press your thumb against its gum until the area turns white. So this should occur fairly quickly. Um, the area will turn white when pressure is applied. You will then release your finger and the white tissue should fill back up with blood and return to a normal color almost immediately. This should take no more than one to two seconds and if it takes any longer, there is a problem with the horse's circulation. So again, you're going to take your thumb um, after you've lift up, lifted up the horse's lip and you're going to apply it to the gum. And then when you release, um, the white area where your thumb initially was um, should return back to a normal color um, nearly immediately within one to two seconds. And our final vital sign that we will look at is gut sounds. A healthy horse will have very audible rumblings in its gut. The simple way to check for gut sounds is to place your ear against the horse's barrel behind the last rib. 
Be sure both sides of the horse are checked, so both the right and the left-hand side, as we are listening to different parts of the digestive tract, um, depending if we are on the right or the left-hand side. Um, the lack of gut sounds is a cause for immediate concern. Um, for example, it may be an indicator of colic, and it is highly recommended that you use a thesoscope as sounds can be difficult to hear. Um, so you can place your ear against the horse's side on the last rib. However, you can also use a thesoscope to better hear a horse's gut sounds. Now that we've gone through preventative care um, as far as basic preventative measures to take in horse um, production and horse owning and management, and then how to evaluate the normal vital signs. So knowing your horse's normal vital signs, like we said, was important so that when you do need to call out a vet, that you know what's normal for that horse. And that can be very helpful in that situation. Um, from there, I'm going to jump into how to wrap a injury on the lower limb. So our horses can receive a number of different types of cuts or injuries, um, puncture wounds, lacerations, um, bruises, scrapes, lots of different types of, of wounds that they can encounter and lots of times that happens on the lower limb. So it's important that you know how to wrap an injury on the lower limb. The first method that I want to discuss is using vet wrap. And considering Applying vet wrap, um, polar wraps, or even even combination boots and different types of productive boots when riding, it's important that we are applying them correctly. If we are to apply a bandage or a protective boot or a wrap incorrectly, then they might not only fail to do their job, but they can also cause discomfort, restrict the blood flow, and potentially damage tendons and other tissues. So it's very important that we do so correctly. In using vet wrap, primarily this is going to be used for horses that have an injury that we are trying to keep dirt and debris out of um, or further protect. And vet wrap should never be applied directly to the horse's skin. When using vet wrap, it's very important that we are using a gauze roll or a cotton roll underneath. So typically when wrapping an injury, we are going to use a um, non-stick gauze pad to apply our, um, apply our ointment of choice or if our um, vet gives us an ointment that we need to be applying for specific reasons, then we want to apply our ointment with the non-stick gauze pad. And that's going to um, ensure that we're not further contaminating that injury by using our hands to pull out our um, pull out our ointment and apply that to the horse's skin. So we can use our non-adhesive um, or non-stick gauze pad to put on our ointment, and then we can use either a gauze roll to put a base layer um, over the horse's leg. Or if it's an injury that needs more protection and more support, we can use a piece of cotton roll. And then to get that bandage to um, stick and stay on the leg, then we will apply vet wrap on the top. Um, when we do use vet wrap in lab this week, if you haven't used it previously, you will um, notice that vet wrap is going to stick to itself. So it's going to adhere to itself when we're wrapping it. But also, um, over time, that vet wrap is going to tighten on the horse's leg. So it's important that when we're applying vet wrap that we make sure that we have it tight enough, that that bandage stays in place, but that it's not too tight and it's um, restricting the blood flow, causing discomfort, or potentially um, damaging the tendons and other sensitive tissue within the horse's leg. So ideally when I use vet wrap, because um, I, I do use vet wrap fairly frequently when I do have a lower limb injury um, or cut that I need to wrap and keep dirt and debris out of, but a good rule of thumb is to put a small slit with scissors at the top and the very bottom 
of that wrap. And so that's going to help to create a pressure point to release pressure on the horse's leg. So that's a little bit of overview of how to correctly use vet wrap to bandage and wrap a horse's leg. The next type of wrap that we will discuss because it can be also be used um, for injury is a polo wrap. A polo wrap is going to provide protection and support in a number of instances. Um, it can support the tendons and ligaments during strenuous workouts. So whether that be um, training or schooling or showing, it is, go it is going to be used to support those tendons and ligaments. It can also be used to protect the legs from concussion and impact while traveling. So anytime we're trailering our horses from point to point, <clears throat> it can be a good idea to wrap our horses in polo wraps um, to provide protection. It can also be used um, to prevent and reduce swelling after exercise um, or to provide protection and prevent um, swelling to an injury while the horse is on stall rest. And then additionally, our fourth function of our polo wraps is shielding leg wounds from contamination and aid in healing. So while they're um, recovering from, from an injury. On the left hand side we have a horse where polo wraps are wrapped directly um, to the horse's leg. So this horse is likely using them for working. Um, so while they are being schooled or training and then it is used on all four legs. So polo wraps can be used on um, just fronts, just hinds, or all four legs. I know my recommendation is when using polo wraps to use them in pairs. So that is obvious when riding, schooling, or training. However, when you have an injury, a lot of times you just think about providing support to that injured leg. However, if our horse injures their front left leg, then they're likely going to compensate with their front right leg. And so in compensating, they may um, provide injury or need extra support to what would be their good leg in this situation. Um, so it's ideal to, if we have an injury on a horse's forelimb, to go ahead and wrap both forelimbs. It also creates a sense of balance. Um, horses where you're only wrapping one leg, there is going to be a level of pressure at which the horse can feel from that wrap and so they may um, try to rid themselves of that bandage and are more likely um, not to if we're wrapping both legs and creating um, balance and equilibrium there. So on the right hand side we have a horse that has what appears to be a cotton roll underneath um, their polo wrap. So likely this is a horse that um, has an injury or they have swelling and we're trying to pull out the swelling um, by use of a polo wrap while they're in the stall. It could also be a horse that is traveling. A lot of times when you're trailering and you're using polo wraps to provide protection, you will put um, a quilted wrap underneath of your polo wrap. Um, and this photograph is a little difficult to tell. Looks like a cotton roll, but if you told me it was a quilt strap, I probably wouldn't question you too much. Um, so a couple of different functionalities and, and how we can use polo wraps is they are very versatile. Another thing that's important with whether it be our polo wraps or our vet wrap or different type of bandages is the direction of which we are wrapping. Um, when wrapping a horse's left leg, we are going to wrap counterclockwise. When wrapping a horse's right leg, we are going to wrap that horse's leg clockwise. So left leg is counterclockwise, right leg is clockwise. The reason it's important that we are wrapping this direction 
um, is we want to make sure that we're not applying stress um, against the tendon. So it's very important that left leg we're wrapping counterclockwise, right legs we're wrapping clockwise. Um, when we are putting on a polo wrap, we want to begin with the end of our polo wrap on the inside of the cannon bone, um, behind the bone, and in front of the tendon in a little groove. Um, then we're going um, to start wrapping midway down the leg and go down the leg, covering approximately 50% of the previous um, previous wrap. So we're going to wrap down the leg. At the bottom of the leg we want to make a per se sling um, underneath the fetlock. So making sure that we're wrapping um, with the lay and the anatomical um, layout of the horse's leg. Once we have gone down to the fetlock created that sling we will then wrap up the leg um, to directly below the knee. Um, and then midway back down. Um, so we're going to start midway down the cannon, go all the way down the leg to the fetlock, make a sling under the fetlock, wrap up to just below the knee, and then wrap midway back down the cannon. And making sure that with each wrap that we're covering approximately 50% of the previous wrap. Previous wrap. Um, correct tension is going to be if you can get two fingers um, under the wrap below the pastern and one finger under the wrap at the top. Um, so it's important um, that these are wrapped correctly um, as far as in the correct direction and also that they are tight enough, they're going to stay on the horse, they're going to provide support um, but we also don't want them loose to the point that the horse is going to injure themselves if they come loose or come off. Um, polo wraps, like I stated initially, they do have Velcro. So when you have completed um, wrapping your horse's leg, you'll see in this diagram on the bottom row in the center, you can see that that Velcro is going to stick back to itself. Um, the more times that you use a polo wrap, the more times that you wash them and they're receiving use and wear and tear, that Velcro um, is going to break down. So I know personally when I'm wrapping for an injury um, or I'm using a pair of polo wraps that are have some age on them, that I will also apply electrical tape over the top of my Velcro, making one single wrap around the horse's leg just to ensure that my polo wraps are going to stay in place. Not a requirement, but a good idea to be aware of. Um, as your materials are aging. And now we're ready to shift gears. As I said at the end of this slide, some of this information was a review for basic equitation. Um, it's recorded and presented a different, a little bit differently if you are in both classes, but these are the slides that will contain new information that is just um, in horse production at this point. So I wanted to hit on this week a couple of common diseases of the lower limbs and the, the hooves of our horses. Reason being for that is a lot of the preventative measures that we've talked about to this point in this slide, if we have those preventative measures in place, we're going to reduce the instances of dealing with these types of injuries and diseases later on down the road. Um, clearly there's genetics and and poor luck or other things that come into play and so ultimately as horse owners or um, an individual managing the facility you're going to deal with some of these um, and the hooves and the lower limbs we've talked about the importance of that to the horse without functionality of our horse's legs we in the hooves we we have no horse to ride we have no horse to produce foals um, they have very very difficult time of being able to to fulfill their purpose. So a couple of those common diseases that I want to look at in the lower limb um, and hoof is going to be white line disease, navicular. Um, navicular can be identified as navicular disease or navicular syndrome and then laminitis. In some instances laminitis is referred to as founder and used in a, interchangeably. Um, some people will argue 
the differences between the two um, for the purposes of this class. So if you use them um, interchangeably, I'm not going to count off on any exam questions or whatnot. So laminitis and founder, um, I'm okay with you using those interchangeably as they are ultimately um, the same. A couple of anatomical parts, just to review, make sure you know where these locations are because they are going to be helpful in understanding these diseases as we get further into content about them. So as far as the left-hand image, we can see our horse's hoof. When discussing white line disease, we want to make sure that we know where the sole is located, where the white line is, and then also where our hoof wall is. So our hoof wall is going to be the exterior of the hoof. So make sure you can identify those three areas as it'll be helpful when discussing white line disease. And talking about navicular and laminitis, it's beneficial if you know the P3. So the P3 is our distal phalanx or our coffin bone. There's a couple of other slang terms um, such as pedal bone that can be used to identify the P3, but this bone is going to uh, affect our horses with laminitis. And then the bone identified by number 11. So 11 is our distal sesamoid bone or our navicular bone. So this is going to be um, the bone of importance when discussing navicular disease or navicular syndrome. Um, it can also be helpful to be able to identify the deep digital flexor tendon um, and other various tendons that are going to run down through our horse's hoof when talking about navicular. But we'll get into that more when we get to our navicular slide. So just make sure that you can identify your sole, your white line, your hoof wall, the P3, which is your distal phalanx, your coffin bone, your pedal bone, and then number 11. 11 is going to be our distal sesamoid bone or navicular bone. White line disease is going to ultimately be the progressive hoof wall separation. Um, it is a hoof infection that is caused by a fungus, a bacteria, or a combination of both that destroy the tissue connecting within the hoof. These organisms are thought to enter the hoof via old nail holes, cracks, and other weak points. Once they are inside, then they slowly erode the layers of connective tissue, known as the laminae, that make up a healthy hoof and hold the coffin bone in place. The coffin bone is the large bone in a horse's hoof and helps shape the hoof wall. This destruction by the white line disease organisms leads to cavities and weaknesses within the hoof. Moreover, if this is left unchecked, the hoof wall slowly disintegrates from the inside out and it requires critical professional care to fix. When considering the causes of white line disease, it is an optimistic disease meaning that the pathogens take advantage of a weakened or compromised hoof wall, such as hoof wall separation caused by an improperly balanced hoof. Examples of this include a horse that has too much toe, which can cause um, mechanical separation of the hoof wall. In discussing sy symptoms, um, I covered that fairly well when discussing um, the disease in the initial introductory section of this slide, um, but symptoms would include concavities and weaknesses of the hoof. As far as treatment, there's a couple of different things that go into treatment of white line disease and is most successful when using a combination of these. Um, it's important to remove the affected hoof wall and also consider soaking the hoof. Um, it's important that when soaking the hoof that you are using a chlorine-based agent once or twice a week and keep the hoof as clean as possible is recommended. And we can also consider special shoeing. As technology develops, we have ever advanced techniques um, involved in treating a, a variety of diseases. Um, so commonly, um, some of these more advanced techniques in treating white line disease involve using 
um, a beveled or a rocker style shoe. Um, this creates a breakover for the hoof to match the angle of the bony column of the leg and in turn reduces the amount of stress on the toe of the hoof wall. Um, and our final option um, or thing to consider in treatment is allowing time for hoof growth. So allowing this horse the time off, um, providing them the nutrition that they need to um, successfully grow um, more toe, more heel, more hoof, and ultimately um, fight off this disease. In discussing navicular disease or navicular syndrome, um, I'm going to be right at home and I'm probably going to have a little too much fun talking about it. Um, unfortunately, I did have two horses that had navicular disease. Um, one was the mare I grew up with, and then the other is my reigning mare that I still have currently. So navicular disease can be a unique disease to treat and maintain a horse that is, is ultimately going to have this um, their lifetime. A couple of areas to be familiar with on the hoof, we talked about being able to locate the navicular bone. So the navicular bone is highlighted in blue on this slide. It's also helpful to be able to identify the deep digital flexor tendon, which is highlighted in yellow, and this is going to run up the back um, of the horse's um, lower limb. We then have the impar ligament, which is highlighted in orange. And then the intersection of the impar ligament and the deep digital flexor tendon, which is shown by the red dot. So those are going to be helpful in understanding um, how this disease develops and what, what ultimately causes it. The navicular bone is a small bone that sits deep within the hoof at the back junction of the coffin bone and the short pastern. The navicular bone has the physical shape of a small canoe, which like the name navicular bone, the prefix navicu means small boat in Latin. The navicular bone is also known as the distal sesamoid bone. And associated with the navicular bone are several soft tissue structures. On the upper aspect of the bone is the collateral sesamoid ligament, which attaches the navicular bone to the distal end of the short pastern. On the lower aspect of the bone are the impar ligaments, which attach the navicular bone to the coffin bone. Cushioning the navicular bone from the pressure of the deep digital flexor tendon is a thin, soft, um, sac called the navicular bursa. The primary function of the navicular bone is to provide a gliding surface at the point where the deep digital flexor tendon changes angle. The tendon courses down the back of the cannon bone and bends around the back of the fetlock between the proximal sesamoid bones and then makes a sharp bend over the navicular bone and attaches on the bottom of the coffin bone. So this can be helpful in understanding the anatomy to better discuss navicular disease. Um, navicular disease is the inflammation of the laminae of the hoof. There are a number of causes of navicular disease, some of which include predispositioned factors. There are um, breeds that are, are diagnosed fairly frequently um, with navicular disease, and so they are said to be predispositioned. This would include quarter horses, thoroughbreds, and warm bloods, as they are diagnosed more frequently than others. Um, other factors to consider is that affected horses tend to be between the ages of 7 and 14, and other predisposition factors are confirmation abnormalities of the hoof, included a broken forward or backward hoof axis, underrun heels, contracted heels, mismatched hoof angles, and disproportionately small feet. In addition to that and causes, we also want to consider incorrect shoeing. I know that was um, thought to be a cause with my older mare is that the way in which she had been shooed, um, it had constricted her heels over time. And so that had assisted um, in developing navicular for her. 
She was also a quarter horse. She was also in that 7 to 14 range. So a couple of different things that predispositioned her, but incorrect shoeing was also at fault. As far as same, excuse me, as far as symptoms, um, primarily we are going to see lameness in the horse. So I know we, it's going to feel like we hit lameness all the time when we're talking about diseases. So it'll be helpful when we talk more about lameness next week in understanding um, different types of lameness. So these horses, um, because the heel area of the foot is what is causing the lameness, the foot tends to land toe to heel, which is opposite of the normal um, heel to toe landing. Sometimes this can be difficult to observe, so recording your horse walking and then watching it in slow motion. Um, if they have a lameness issue, then you can see that horse landing toe to heel instead of naturally, which naturally would be heel to toe landing. Um, and then there's also a number of diagnostic testings which can be performed by a veterinarian. That includes the fetlock flexion test, the wedge test, the frog pressure tests, um, and then also hoof testers can be used to determine if navicular um, is, is considered the issue. As far as treatment methods, there is a number of therapeutic shoeings, um, medications, and also surgeries which can take place to correct this issue. Um, personally, as a treatment method, um, veterinary recommended, I have put horses in aluminum wedge shoes, and then I've also used a rocker shoe. As for medications, um, Prevacox was high, came highly recommended, which is actually a medication originally developed um, for dogs, but it also is beneficial and helpful um, in use in horses. And our final one to discuss is going to be laminitis. Laminitis is um, sometimes often or is sometimes also referred to as founder, and this is inflammation of the laminae of the hoof. Laminitis is a common and potentially devastating foot problem that affects all members of the equine family. This disease process involves a breakdown of the bond between the hoof wall and the distal phalanx, which is also commonly called the coffin bone, the pedal bone, or the third phalanx. Um, for ease, I'm going to refer to it as the coffin bone. The coffin bone in the horse is equivalent to the bone at the top of the human finger. It is completely encased in the hoof, and as with the um, human fingernail, the hoof wall is firmly attached to the coffin bone by a strong um, dermal epidermal bond. The hoof wall coffin bone bond is the only thing that prevents the horse's body weight from forcing the coffin bone through the bottom of the sole of the hoof. This bond must be strong enough to withstand the forces sustained by the hoof at a gallop, however yet dynamic enough to allow the hoof wall to grow. In order to maximize the strength of the hoof wall coffin bone bond, this interface is connected by several hundred folds referred to as the lamellae. The surface of each um, laminae is itself folded into many smaller secondary laminae, which further increases the surface area and thus the strength of the hoof wall and coffin bone bond. When considering the causes of laminitis, our main causes are going to be grain overload, ingestion of lush grass, severe intestinal disease, um, to include surgical colic or diarrhea, and then also sepsis. Um, this is circulating bacteria in the bloodstream, which can be the result of a number of factors. When considering symptoms of laminitis, again, we're going to go um, back and talk about lameness more. Um, signs of laminitis vary with the severity of the damage to the laminae and whether the laminitis episode is acute or if it is chronic. The most common sign that we are going to see is lameness, which is ranging in severity from a minor head nod to non-weight bearing and the inability of the horse to stand, having the appearance of walking on eggshells or a sawhorse stance. An increase in digital pulse pressure in the arteries that supply the affected foot are referred to as a bounding digital pulse. 
and or the hoof wall may feel warm or hot to the touch, which can also be a common finding. Um, laminitis is commonly occurring in the forelimbs and both forelimbs, but can also occur in all four hooves, especially with circulating systematic diseases. In severe cases, the a symptom would be the rotation of the coffin bone, so the rotation or the dropping or sinking of the coffin bone. So the x-ray shown on the right hand side is going to be a horse that is suffering from laminitis and you can see that that coffin bone has dropped. In severe, severe cases, the coffin bone can actually protrude through the sole of the horse's hoof. As for treatment, um, there are a number of options for, um, for treating laminitis which include medical management of the um, underlying primary cause, um, chirotherapy, which is a horse that will be standing in ice boots, and then also metaculous nursing. So care as these horses may spend a major part of their time lying down, which can cause additional problems. So we're gonna make, wanna make sure that we're providing these horses um, with comfort and all the necessities to set them up for success in um, beating this disease. And I thought I was going to make it shorter this time, but I made it two minutes longer. Regardless, um, hopefully you all have been able to hear the visual, hear the, the words on this one, and I will get it posted and you'll be ready to complete your week 6A assignment.